I'm Will from MB UK, and today I'm here with Bike Radar's Tom Law to discuss the future of drivetrains. He's going to show me why I don't need these anymore. <laughs> that was so loud, oh my god. Tom is a mountain bike presenter for Bike Radar and a self-confessed bike dork, so there aren't many people who know more about gears than Tom. He's even spent time riding SRAM's new T-Type and will be giving us the lowdown. Tom, we're seeing a massive leap in the number of electronic and wireless shifters on the market nowadays. Is this something that is set to continue? Yeah, definitely. The market is becoming a lot busier with electronic drivetrains. You've got stuff like SRAM's Axis, which has been about for a little while now, Shimano's DI2. We've also seen FSA coming out with some prototypes of their wireless stuff and some patents going on there as well. But I have to say for me, SRAM have been leading the way with their Axis system. Uh, wireless is just so much easier to set up. There's no cables or anything to route through the frames, particularly with like headset cable routing and stuff like that. And they've recently released the new T-Type drivetrain as well. It's a massive game changer. It's not the gearbox that people are wanting, but it definitely pushes the game forward an awful lot. So what are the advantages to electronic shifting? It has to be worth the extra weight, the extra complexity, and remembering to charge up your batteries, right? Yeah, well, for one, it's a nail in the coffin for internal cable routing, which for one, I despise far more complicated than it needs to be. So that's a massive benefit straight away. So you've got a cleaner look. They are a little bit heavier, but you're losing that weight from the gear cables and everything as well. I'm not really missing what Shimano are doing with their like semi-wireless DI2. I think that wireless access, fully removing the cables from the equation is definitely the way to go. How do Shimano and SRAM's electronic shifters differ then, Tom? So with Axis, with their new T-Type stuff, they've got a completely new design over the older shifter-inspired rocker paddle design. So on T-Type, there's two little buttons that you use to go up or down the cassette, and you can use those with their RockShox flight attendant suspension or reverb axis dropper post. The Shimano Di2 is more of a, an, akin to a traditional sort of shifter. They've tried to mimic that. So maybe if they release further stuff for Di2 for mountain bikes, we'll see that change a little bit. So it'll be more like the T-Type system. Not only that, but the consistency of the shifting is a lot better than a cable operated system because whenever you press that button, it's gonna be the same exactly as you shift every single time. And you'll never have to adjust or change a gear cable again, which is a massive, massive time saver. It's a real pain with the internal cable route, but just can you imagine never having to adjust cable tension ever again? What about affordability though, Tom? Electronic shifting is very expensive. Uh, do you see it becoming more affordable in the future? I see it becoming cheaper. Whether you want to use the term affordable is a different matter. Obviously with T-Type, we've seen them introduce three levels at the moment. So XXSL, XS and XO1. So it is going to get cheaper. I don't think you could ever call it affordable. I always think that cable operated drivetrains are going to have the edge when it comes to sheer affordability. They are just always going to be cheaper, I think. Tom, you've seen and briefly ridden SRAM's new T-Type drivetrain. So tell us, what is there to get excited about? I mean, the big thing is that they've removed the gear hanger from the equation. So obviously that's the replaceable bit that you've just so stylishly thrown all over the table here. So getting rid of that, it does raise some concerns about durability. Obviously it could save the frame and the derailleur having that replaceable hanger. But for me, getting rid of that with T-Type just makes shifting so much better. It's a much stiffer interface between the frame and the derailleur. It shifts so much cleaner. It's genuinely a game changer. It's not the gearbox that everybody's asking for, but it is a massive, massive improvement compared to even their older Axis drivetrains. So with T-Type, it mounts onto their UDH derailleur hanger interface. So obviously if you've got a UDH compatible bike, you just remove the UDH hanger, fit T-Type straight on there, and then it's all good to go. There's no need to adjust it with limit screws or anything like that, just bolt it directly onto the frame. And it's held from both sides, right? So that's where the stiffness comes from. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it's held on both sides of the bike as well. So it's a super, super stiff mounting point. So it's a step above the UDH hanger and a step above Shimano's direct mount hanger as well. 
kind of. So Shimano introduced their direct mount hangers way back in 2012, but it was kind of just a beef up version of a regular derailleur hanger. It never really caught on because you were limited to running only a Shimano derailleur with that. Obviously with UDH and T-Type, you can still run either drivetrain. You can run T-Type if you want to, but if you do want to run a Shimano drivetrain, you can just fit a UDH hanger on there and run that. So you're not as tied into the system as you were with Shimano direct mount. Okay, so it's similar to the direct mount Saint system in 2003, where Shimano bolted the downhill mech directly to the axle. Yeah, so it is a similar kind of thing to Saint for sure, but a vast, vast improvement on that. Obviously, back in those days, they mounted the derailleur straight onto the axle. In this, it mounts onto the frame, but there's a number of other systems that they've got to protect it in case of damage, because obviously it's quite an expensive bit of kit. If you want more details on that, check out the video on T-Type. But yeah, it is a lot more expensive, but they have their clever overload clutch built in. So that basically disengages the motor from the derailleur. So if you hit a rock or something like that, it moves the derailleur out of the way and then springs it back into place once it's been hit, which is a really, really neat feature. And a lot of the stuff on T-Type is replaceable as well. So they have replaceable um, skid plates that are on there. Obviously you can replace the jockey wheels and the lower cages. Uh, and even the clutch is replaceable now, which is a nice thing to have. Obviously SRAM cages don't have the best reputation uh, when it comes to their clutch tension. But yeah, if you wanted to replace that, you can now do it. So that's wild. So you're saying that when your mech is hit by something, it disengages from being a gear changer and just gets out of the way and saves your frame from damage instead of a replaceable mech hang. Yeah, exactly. So it kind of works in a similar kind of principle to that, just gets the derailleur out of the way nice and easy. Alex Evans, our senior technical editor, he's been hammering his T-type drivetrain for over a thousand kilometers now. And we both know Alex, he can ride a bike pretty hard and he treats his gears with very, very little respect. Um, and his has held up absolutely fine. You know, it still shifts just as well today as it did when it was brand new. So massive improvement in terms of durability for sure. Well, wait a minute, why can't we just get rid of derailers altogether? Like, there's companies out there making gearboxes and they're promising every year that it's finally going to arrive and we're going to get rid of those mechs swinging around on the back of our bikes. Um, where are all the gearbox bikes? I think gearboxes will have their place and they're great in principle, but I do think at this point in time there's just too many downsides to them. They're heavy, they're expensive, they are a lot more complex. Um, and the drag that comes with them as well, I think is too much for bikes that are gonna be pedaled about all day. The reduction in efficiency is just too much. On a downhill bike where, you know, real durability and you're not too bothered about the pedaling efficiency, that's where they really start to come into their own. But for like your enduro, your trail and your cross country bikes, that drag is just gonna be too much to overcome for now. So it'll be interesting to see what brands can do to sort of see if they can alleviate that, you know, in the years to come. Mm. I remember riding a bike in uh, Finale. I had a Nikolai with a pinion gearbox and a belt drive. It was lovely and smooth. All the weight was like in the middle between my feet. The suspension worked amazingly. But when it came to a road climb, I was like sprinting as hard as I could and everyone else with their normal drive trains and chains and mechs and cassettes were just spinning away chatting. So the extra drag is definitely real. Yeah, it definitely feels like you've almost got your back brake sort of rubbing. It's, it's that kind of sensation, isn't it? Where you're just not quite getting all the power that you're putting into the pedals going into the back wheel. So yeah, it's a really interesting concept, but I think we're a way off at becoming mainstream just yet. So gearboxes with cogs can be draggy and complicated, but what about the mech in a box design, like the Honda RN01? Could we see something like that instead? Yeah, so I really do love that Honda. Such a stunning bike, even what, like 15 years later? still an absolutely gorgeous bike obviously they confirmed that on their world cup bikes it was you know effectively a gearbox sort of mechanism made out of a derailleur and a cassette hidden within that box uh, but we've seen similar things from the likes of trinity uh, so they're obviously running a sort of hack down sort of version of that but it's sort of hidden within the frame but not in a total box sort of configuration and obviously speaking of Nikolai as well they're using the uh, the Lal Bike Supre drivetrain as well which basically separates two parts of the derailleur so you've got the shifting mechanism which is neatly hidden inside the rear triangle with the tensioner in the in the front triangle there as well you know working with that high pivot so we are seeing similar sort of concepts but again I don't think they're going to catch on into the mainstream just yet. So yeah, it does look amazing, kind of like, as you say, a naked Honda gearbox bike. And it's cool to see manufacturers like Trinity and Nikolai adopting something new. I do wonder if it'll catch on one day. So there you have it. The future is now. Mech hangers and gear cables are a thing of the past, 
and as electronics get more refined and cheaper, AI will be protecting our mechs for us. But what do you think? What do you want to see attached to your bike? Affordable wireless shifting? The return of replaceable mech hangers? Or do you prefer old school single speed and a wear resistant belt drive? Let us know in the comments. I like how there's no particular warranty. It's just. There was. There, was. there, there was. isn't anymore. There isn't now.